This time on Poll Hub, one of the bigger secrets in polling is women, especially in the first couple of decades of the modern scientific polling industry. Women were the backbone of that industry. We'll talk with Kalina Thompson, who's written about women in polling. This is really fascinating, so stick for this. Then how can you get included in the next Marist poll? Well, you can't. Well, you can't control it. Well, we'll explain. And an Earth Day fun fact. Plenty to discuss here, so let's get to it. And hi, everybody. Welcome to Poll Hub. I'm J.D. Dapper, Director of Innovation here at the Marist Poll. And I'm Barbara Carvalho, Director of the Marist Poll. And I'm Mary Griffith, Media Director for the Marist Poll, sitting in for Lee Marengoff today. And I get to commit some reverse sexism or something here by saying I shouldn't be leading this segment because this segment is about women in polling. And we have two women in polling and a guest of ours is joining who's a woman who talks about women in polling. So why am I doing this? That's because you're, you're really interested in this topic. It is actually quite a fascinating topic. It is fascinating. So let's talk with Quilina Thompson. She is a graduate student. Well, actually, Quilina, tell us who you are, where you uh, study, and about the article you wrote. That's probably the easiest way instead of me doing it for you. Absolutely. Um, well, I'm Quilina Thompson. I'm a PhD candidate at uh, Cornell University in the history department. Um, and my kind of broad interests are women's labor history, um, the second half of the 20th century. Um, so really, I kind of look at sort of this changing of institutions, so colleges, um, changing in labor patterns, so where they're landing. Um, and all of that kind of ties together, I think, interestingly, with polling, which I didn't know was going to happen, though. Um, so I ended up getting a fellowship at the Roper Center. Um, to do uh, some summer research. And I worked with Kathleen Weldon and she said, you know what, we normally have a lot of our graduate students do a kind of sort of data entry. So we, we, change, we change ASCII data into usable data. Um, well, that sounds very, very riveting. productive. We, we, yeah. tor we torture students with <laughs> tasks like that as well. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, I have an economics background, so I kind of thought that's what I was going to end up doing too. I was, and I was fine with that, right? Like, you know, a little data entry, you could just sort of tune out for a little bit, um, you know, and, and, and get the work done. But um, Kathleen actually was like, you know what, let's use this history background that you have and this history degree that you're working on now. And let's see if we can do something a little bit, a uh, little bit more interesting. And so I, um, the idea was to kind of come up with these sort of shorter blog posts that looked at the history of polling, looked at kind of in interesting sort of turning points in survey research. Um, and so I'm starting this project and I'm, and, and I'm coming into polling history just blank, right? You know, I, I, I know what a poll is. I, I know how it's used in data. But sometimes that's the best way yeah. to take a really fresh look at things. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and I've heard a lot of these names kind of thrown, you know, the Bureau of Applied Social Research. I, you know, I, I knew the names, I recognized them, um, but I didn't kind of have that long narrative. And so I really started to build it from scratch. And what was so interesting was to sort of see the number of uh, female names that kind of kept popping up. And um, just kind of from my own experience, I know when looking at looking for women workers and looking for women's labor participation, it's hard to find them because they're often so invisible. They're doing a different kind of work. They're doing a, a work that's really easy to write out of a narrative. Um, and this is especially interesting. True in academia, when you kind of get attached to a lab or you get attached to a research project, those are generally, especially in the 1940s and 50s, helmed by men. So you kind of have this different strata of women who are doing different kinds of work. So that was one piece that was incredibly interesting to me. And I was like, you know what, let's start talking about this, this group of people. Um, the other really interesting part of this for me was doing some more of the research and, and asking myself, well, who's doing the interviews? How are they getting this information? And, and again, it kind of repeats a sort of standard narrative that I think we have about women's labor participation. They're doing the on the ground data retrieval. They're doing the in data input. They're punching the cards. They're doing this absolutely foundational work. But again, it's so easy to write it out of a story because the big name, the, you know, the big department head, the big research manager gets the attention um, and a lot of that stuff gets hidden. So that was, that's kind of- And how that I'm person's a man Yes. in much of this case, yeah. yeah. And I was gonna say, Kalina, it's almost your piece had this hidden figures sort of quality to, about it. 
Um, how prevalent were female pollsters in, in the 1940s and 50s? And tell us a little bit about their role. Yeah, uh, incredibly prevalent. And and especially by the, the 50s, really, um, because it's part-time labor. And so there's this interesting kind of confluence of events that happens, right? So we've gone through the World War II, where we already know we've got this mass entrance of women into the labor field, right? Because there's a labor shortage. Um, this happens, I think we think about Rosie the Riveter a lot. We think about women in factories. And we don't really tell this other story about women as secretaries, women as clerical workers, women as coders, women as you know statistical analysts, right? We don't talk about those women, but they're there. Um, you know, I didn't talk about this in this particular piece because it has a little bit more to do with computing. But you know, there was a statistical department that was run out of the University of Pennsylvania where they were bringing women in and teaching them these kind of high-level statistical analysis um, to do ballistics computing. So all of the, the kind of the, you know, the art of everything we know about ballistics computing and a lot of ways has come from, from women, right? And that's part of that hidden figures story. Um, but the same thing is happening for public opinion research. And, you know, that was what was so interesting to me. So you have, you have this moment where women come into the field and then are pushed out, right? So by the time the war ends and, you know, everyone returns, the GI Bill gets started, men go to college, they get master's in business administration, they get master's in statistics, they get PhDs, fully funded in so many ways, and women quietly go back to the home. But they've been incredibly educated at this point. They've had this work experience that it's a little hard for some of them to give up. So latching on to part-time opportunities is really exciting for them. And so you kind of see when this part-time data stuff comes up, right? So to do the field interviews, this is a chance to use my college degree. This is, a, I'm so interested in this, you know, this is a chance to use the psychology degree that I got. Um, so it just kind of, it like, it meets the moment in a really interesting way, I think. So women at this point too have had a a number of opportunities to continue their education. But in your uh, research uh, into the labor movement during this time, they don't exactly find uh, a lot of places that are welcoming to women with college education and a lot of positions available to them. Yeah, yeah, very much so, especially women who have gotten married. Um, and women who have children. So this is especially so for them. Um, and it's, I think why it's important to kind of take when you're looking at um, women's labor force participation to kind of take a cohort look to kind of group women around ages and not just say women in general, right? Because women at different stages of their life have different experiences. So single, you know, fresh out of college, single high school graduates, have a different relationship to the labor market than a woman who's married and a woman who has a few children. Um, and that's particularly because prior to 1964, we've got the kind of wholesale use of marriage bars, right? So, you know, they're gently and not so gently asked to leave the labor force um, by the time they're married, and especially if they find themselves with child, um, which is why this kind of field interviewing is so interesting to me because it allows married women, women with children. So the woman that I kind of profile for the for the length of the article has three kids. She has three kids and a college degree. Um, and so she's able to do this work and also manage her home life at the same time. And that of course is, this is another thread of my research is to just look at how women are trying to, to match these two different aspects of their life together. And you know, I think we think of this as like a, a modern woman's problem, but you know, this has been, it, it's been going on for, for decades now. But being a pollster in the 40s and 50s was not easy work. You go into quite a bit of detail about what it was really like to be a pollster. Now, we're not using telephones. They're going door to door. We're not online for sure. Um, so they're, they're actually going face to face to, to get these interviews. Absolutely. So that was the kind of interesting thing about just the, the nature of polling history that I found. So for Gallup and Roper, they actually, when they initially kind of set up these field interviews, preferred people to go into homes to get a sense of the socioeconomic category that they should fall into. So they never wanted to interview people outside of these spaces because you couldn't see 
you know, is it a three, you know, poke your head around, is it a three bedroom home? Is there a bathroom in here? Are there rugs on the ground? You know, like what, what exactly is the actual economic arrangement of this household? Um, well, that's a really a good point because now we ask many of those questions because we're not, we're not seeing people, we're dependent upon their, you know, subjective uh, opinion about uh, those types of characteristics. But um, that wasn't the case in that time. It was very different means of polling. Absolutely. So they're going into homes. That's another reason why women are really a great kind of person to be doing this kind of work. You know, especially if you kind of think about a housewife who's answering the door, is she going to let in a kind of strange looking man who says he's a Gallup pollster and, you know, like I, uh, you know, I'm not. Even if he's in a suit. Even if he's in a suit, like, you know, I don't know this guy. <laughs> Um, so women, again, are kind of, they, they are able to establish a different kind of rapport. And so Gallup and Roper catch on to this. They realize that women are kind of uniquely suited for this kind of work. But, but you know, to your initial question, it is really difficult work. I mean, they are walking for blocks and blocks, um, you know, kind of the initial way that they started to do statistical sampling. You know, Roper would say, all right, answer, go to every third house in this particular neighborhood. And, you know, that was just walking everywhere. Um, you know, some of the more interesting stories that came out were, were some of these women and when they went to Harlem, right? And, um, you know, the, the feedback that a lot, of, a lot of them gave to their survey um, supervisors were, the streets don't make sense here. This building was run down. I didn't feel comfortable like like the this like the second floor was completely missing, you know, like I didn't feel comfortable walking, you know, so they so they are absolutely doing harrowing work. Um, you know, but what I think is so interesting about this particular moment, the 40s and the 50s, and you kind of think about polling being this sort of tool for democracy, as Gallup says, you know, it's it, they really felt it was a civic duty. They really felt like they were participating in a kind of national project um, and, and promoting what, you know, the American public and who the American public was. And so that came out a bit in Edith Halsey's, you know, report back, like she just really felt committed to it. It's interesting. We have um, a lot of interns we work with and they do a lot of work on uh, our social media content. A lot of that is longer blog posts and things like that. And one thing that comes up repeatedly is we use the Roper archives to look at trend data or earlier this semester, uh, a couple of, um, a couple of the, the interns had this idea of what questions were asked about or of women mm -hmm. a long time ago and how, what would we think of them today? And it is a either, depending on your take on it, it is either a riotously funny or a horrific <laughs> uh, piece because of the questions that were asked. But one of the things that came out of that, and I just, the reason I mentioned this is, um, I, I told them, well, you know that, that men and women went often as teens into the field to ask some types of questions because it was all door to door. And then they started thinking about some of these questions and whether a woman would ask a woman this or a man would ask a man this. And there was all this gender dynamics or sex dynamics, whatever, inside just the questions themselves. Did you, did you see any of that in, in what you were looking at? Anything about the questions themselves and how they were asked and who got to ask them? Yeah, so I think this is going to kind of um, blow that up just a little bit, only because what was so interesting about these in-person interviews that they decided that, you know, became part of polling history um, was that they couldn't get a handle on what the interviewer was actually doing in during the interview. So they, they eventually started to catch wind that nobody was following the script. Like there would, be a, <laughs> there would be a question and then the interviewer would decide like, I'm just going to revamp it, you know, or what they would find is that they would ask a question. So what immediately comes to mind is there was a question about whether or not someone was an atheist and this particular interviewer, you know, she asked the question and the respondent says, I don't know what an atheist is. And so she then, she then says, would you vote for someone who was a sinner or who was not? And like, <laughs> you know, that's not really what atheist means. <laughs> um, so I, I guess just to kind of answer that question is, you know, I'm I'm skeptical about how much people were following this. You know, what 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 were they saying? Sure. Right. So if you oh, that's very interesting. If you start looking at some of these field reports, right? So, so they do the field interview, and then they also do a report on like what their day was like, what challenges they faced, what they could do differently. Um, this is particularly for Roper because Gallup kind of 
just sends them like a, you know, and here's a mail in the box interviewing preparation, goodbye and good luck. You know, you guys are reasonably educated people. You can figure this out. Roper had a very top down kind of management process. So they, they, they had supervisors that they had to respond to and interact with. So, so when you get the field reports, um, and I think these archives are still at Yale, I'm not sure. Um, but when you get the field reports, you get a lot more of that feedback. It's like, I just kind of changed that question or, you know, something that was particularly interesting to me was, um, you know, for thinking about, you know, women in polling in this particular time, it's generally white middle-class women. Um, and so when they're interacting with, with um, black respondents that they're noticing that they're having a hard time pulling out certain information, like they're having a hard time establishing rapport. And so the field reports kind of come back and say like, I don't know if I should be asking these questions. They, they clearly don't feel comfortable with me. Um, and so, you know, when Roper sent people down south, he tried to get as many black interviewers as possible, but that got a little bit trickier in kind of northeastern cities. So again, that's just it's so interesting to me to kind of think about what actually happened um, or what the interviewers thought happened, and then the kind of the written data that we have, right? Which is like, here was the question, did they ask the question? Sounds like there's a, a whole nother uh, area of research for you to pursue in that, because uh, that sounds fascinating as well. Uh, Colina Thompson, thanks for coming on, graduate student at, at Cornell. And, and this piece is on the Roper Center. We'll, we'll put a link to it in the show notes called Women in Public Opinion Polling. You hear about the Roper Center on this podcast every time. So here's one more reason to go see it. Great piece. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Well, that was such a great segment with Colina. So we're going to shift gears a little bit and go from polling then to polling now. After uh, one of our recent polls, we were kind of peppered with some fan mail, not necessarily bad fan mail, but just a question about how individuals can participate in our poll. And so after we got quite a few of those, uh, after one of our recent polls, we're going to bring up that question again. So Barb, take it away. How can people participate in our polls? You know, it's it's so interesting. You know, it's so interesting because I, I, I find it um, kind of, uh, you know, somewhat entertaining because people always think about surveys as uh, and pollsters as people, you know, respondents not wanting to participate, not wanting to answer, you know, the door slammed in your face, the phone hung up, you know, the email deleted, you know, what, whatever the, you know, whatever the current mode is. But we, you're, you're right, Mary, we actually get um, a, a number of people who contact us who want to know why they haven't been called. I mean, some of it is is about, um, you know, they feel that it's not necessarily representative. So perhaps you, you know, didn't call the right people. But a number of them contact us to just say, OK, where can I sign up so that I can add my opinion uh, to, to the poll? And in scientific research, as we've talked many times, you know, on this on this podcast, um, it's the researcher that is choosing the individuals who are going to be uh, in, in, the, in the survey. Uh, now that sounds like the researcher has a lot of control, but we're actually doing this statistically and electronically. So for us, when we are doing telephone polling, um, we are actually using databases uh, that have literally every phone number that exists in the United States, either in landline, or uh, it, on a cell phone. And the, the numbers are mixed up. So the last two digits of the phone numbers um, are mixed up. It's called random digit dialing. And literally when our interviewers are calling or trying to encourage someone to participate, they have no more information about that individual except for the phone number that's in front of them. And what this allows is for anybody who does have a telephone, landline, or cell phone, you do have the opportunity or the possibility that you will win the Maris Poll lottery and have us and have us give you a, give you a call. So um, we don't set up polls in a way where people, what we call in the polling biz, self-select mean they select themselves to come in and participate. Instead, um, it's, it's, based on, it's based on phone numbers and random selection for, for doing that. So unfortunately, um, we'd love to have you know, a, a survey of people who love polling and who want to participate. Um, but 
we have to do it the other way around in order to be scientific, to be representative and accurate. Have the number of people asking that question um, increased over the last few years? Because if you think about how many polls in social media there are now that are not polls, they're like, you know, they're straw polls, right. which is not a poll like we're talking about, uh, or even the online polls that are done, you know, by major organizations, people are opting into those or being recruited into those. And sometimes getting incentives to do that, too. And getting incentives, right. Has that increased the number of people who are at the, the the frequency with which we get this question, or has this always been there? I, I mean, I think it, I think it has. I mean, it, it has, it, you know, it's been there for, you know, you know, it's always been there somewhat. People have a curiosity as well to how do you actually get into a poll? But I think this idea that you can participate in so many different ways um, online for businesses and organizations and even friends and family to, you know, to ask questions and those look like polls. Um, they're not scientific polls, as you point out, Jay, and there is a method to our madness. And part of that is the selection process where we need something other than just your eagerness to want to be included uh, to be able to participate. I also think that there's uh, more awareness of polls than perhaps in the past, especially in the last couple of election cycles. I think people have become more engaged for better or for worse and for whichever side that they, they tend to stand on. Um, and I think that they want to have their opinion heard. And I think that's that's great. But as Barb points out, it needs to be done in a scientific way. Yeah. And I think what we find um, that can happen, too, is that people think that most people don't respond to polls. But in essence, what happens is we just have a hard time getting a hold of people because there are so many phone numbers. There are so many things that happen after we dial a number, including the number not being you know, actually existing. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a method to the madness, but it does, does get a little crazy. So Lee isn't with us um, today. He had uh, he had to step away, um, and thank you very much, Mary. Uh, we love to we love to have you, uh, you know, host uh, along with us. I think he didn't want to talk about women in polling. I think he <laughs> stayed off. The <laughs> well, one never knows whether what the motive was, but we were glad, very glad to have you to have you, Mary. So you. Um, I have been de designated with uh, Lee's fun fact uh, today. So I don't know. Can I call it Barbara's fun fact? Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we are actually uh, recording today, April 22nd, which is marked as Earth Day. And the first Earth Day was held uh, in April 22nd of night in the year 1970, meaning I guess this is the 51st year um, of Earth Day where we, uh, as, a, as, a, as a nation, had decided to recognize the fact that we were connected to nature and the Earth and needed to take responsibility for it. So, of course, uh, what do we do? We go back into the Roper archives to see what people uh, thought along the way. Um, and there was actually quite a positive uh, feeling towards the concept of Earth Day. Uh, we have today a heart teeter research uh, poll that was done for the NBC News and the Wall Street Journal. Um, and heart is actually still doing these polls for NBC, but we have one from April of 1990. So, so that would have been 20, 20 years uh, into this, uh, this recognition uh, for Earth Day. And 63% of people in 1990 actually supported um, Earth Day. It's always been, it's always been very popular. Um, it has continued to be so over time. Uh, we now refer to it, I think, more as climate change uh, and a whole host of other issues uh, that we think about. Um, but on this Earth Day, what comes to mind, Mary, Jay, for you? Oh, gosh. Well, for me, it's a really great a, a recognition or awareness that this tradition is carrying on. My boys are in school, elementary school, and they have a whole week where they get to do, uh, they get to dress down with different themes throughout the week. Um, because they're celebrating Earth Day, and at the same time, they're learning about Earth Day. And I think back to the mid-1990s, I'm not going to share what grade I was in at that point, but, um, you know, where Earth Day really came into its own, I think. And, you know, again, thinking about the time period that was around the time of the Clinton administration, and, you know, that was before um, 
uh, Al Gore took on climate change as his his cause. And, you know, um, it's just to me, I think about the change and the evolution and where we're going and how how much of an issue climate change and, and the environment is today. Jay? Yeah, I mean, I rem- yeah, I remember the first Earth Day I was in elementary school, but but what it think what it comes to me or what what strikes me about Earth Day and it did last year as well is again I mentioned earlier in the show we have interns that we work with who are juniors and seniors generally a few sophomores uh, here at Marist, and it is amazing to me how passionate every one of them it, that we've worked with is about the environment in ways that in the 70s, as it was a movement, you know, I had older sisters and, you know, they, you know, they did green Earth day kinds of things and were, you know, puka shells or did whatever. I don't know what they did. I was young. Anyway, they were very interested in the environment. The environment is very important, uh, but in a very fundamentally different way than what you see now. I mean, these students that we work with, this is what they want to write about. This is what they want to research. This is what they care about. And in, in the same way, I think that we see from other young people in the media, it's not kind of, it doesn't strike me as a, well, you know, we'll get to it. This is for them. This is a crisis that is not going to wait until they get old because they know this planet's not going to look like it does by the time they get to our age. So that's what strikes me on this earth day is that 51 years later, it's way more important and way more has way more passion behind it especially among younger people than i think it did even at the time i do want to add one thing i said 63 percent of people of americans uh supported the idea of an earth day in 1990 but i do want to point out only three percent said that they were not in favor the others just were kind of in the middle and uh neutral neutral on the topic so uh, it's certainly been on the minds of Americans for a very long time. And uh, I think you're right, Jay. Criti- critical time. And that's going to do it for this edition of Poll Hub. Poll Hub is a production of the Marist Poll at Marist College in beautiful Poughkeepsie, New York. I'm Mary Griffith and Poll Hub's executive producer. Thanks so much for joining us today. Rounding out our production team are Casey Schaff, our production supervisor, Amelia Morell, our production assistant, and Marcello Bettman, our trusted editor. Of course, thanks to the Roper Center Archive at Cornell University. They provide us with the ability to look back at survey questions and results over the decades. And if you have questions or comments, reach out to us on social media. We're at Maris Poll on Twitter and Maris Poll on Facebook and Instagram. Finally, if you like what you hear on Poll Hub, please consider leaving us a review on your podcasting app of choice. Positive reviews help others find us. And while you're at it, why not go ahead and subscribe? Again, thanks for being here. We'll catch you next week.